just over a century ago. Legend says it all began with the roar of a lion. A local doctor heard one from a menagerie in the distance, and their next thought would eventually create what's now known as the world's most famous zoo. Hi, I'm Zach Handel, and welcome to this very special episode where Sue Tours hits the West Coast once again, introducing for the first time the San Diego Zoo. I'm sure you've heard good things about this place, and I'm gonna guess a majority of you have been here before. This zoological society opened back in 1916 in what was once a little city that aspired to be big things. The San Diego Zoo grew with this previously mentioned menagerie and began to expand by 1921. What also grew from here was the future of animal exhibitry. As you could guess, the park became a pioneer for building cageless exhibits. Their habitats now stretch 100 acres across Balboa Park and contain more than 3,700 animals, exhibiting rarely ever heard of creatures, dedicating time and effort to global conservation for endangered wildlife and a genius marketing department are why people from every corner of the world flock towards the San Diego Zoo. I managed to make two visits on my trip and was even assisted on one by a great guy named Mark, who actually, if you recall, filmed the entirety of episode 50, and without him, I couldn't have done any of this. Together, we were able to cover 50% of the zoo's most vital exhibits. That's seven separate videos that I will show you over a span of several years, beginning with the exhibit The World, couldn't wait to see. Only open in 2017, it is still the newest project unveiled by the San Diego Zoo. From the first habitat to the last, with the behind the scenes areas and including the tram path, this space tracks eight and a half acres, making it the largest consecutively constructed project in franchise history. The Lost Forest, though, takes the cake, being the park's largest area, but it opened in several phases. Africa Rocks didn't come from an expansion. Rather, it lies on the former outdated grounds of the Dog and Cat Canyon that had exhibits from the 1930s that were once considered to be the best in the world. However, Africa Rocks isn't a new nickname, as half of that area was already called this, though there were barely any African animals by its demise. With $68 million, the zoo revamped this area to now be composed of 20 individual exhibits, 13 of which are brand new, that make up six separate venues, showing off those from the savannah to the sea. So the stage is set, and without further ado, let's rock! Around the Asian Passage is a portal to the mother of mankind, beginning with the sea. First phase of the new Africa Rocks, a gorgeous, now iconic 5,000 square foot aquarium known as Cape Finebos. Appropriately, you'll find penguins of South Africa, one of 14 penguins that prefer temperate or warmer climates. With Africa Rocks, this is the first time in 35 years the zoo has prominently displayed penguins in such a way. Supposedly, they've held off this long on having them as a way not to compete with the neighboring SeaWorld San Diego. Another reason why the world's most famous zoo probably doesn't have a true aquarium. With them, believe it or not, are 12 leopard sharks, which coincidentally came from SeaWorld. But ironically, they are found along the coast of the United States and not South Africa. And no, they don't harm one another because they do share the same diet. Their underwater section features 85 feet of glass, boasting a 13 foot deep, 200,000 gallon saltwater pool that artificially produces waves. It's also what I consider to be the greatest spot in the entire park to just sit down relax and enjoy the view. But Cape Finebos does not end there, as the path takes you outside to show you its remaining space. 
In fact, that was only 50% of it. Outside, there are two more underwater viewing windows and a panoramic view towards the very end, finishing off its impressive stretch of 170 feet. Venue number two, the West African Forest. But before we go to that, it's worth mentioning between this and the last region is a small cafe rest stop. But fun fact, according to the original plans, instead here would have been the spot for an II nocturnal house. If only. Like Cape Finebos, West Africa is only one exhibit, a smaller but still impressive display for the West African dwarf crocodile and several Madagascar native turtles. However, what's also part of this area is the centerpiece behind this rock. Welcome to Rady Falls, considered to be the heart of the San Diego Zoo. Donated by philanthropist Ernest Rady with a generous amount of $10 million. It was built with the intention for people all over the park to come and congregate, with the vision that millions of pictures would be taken here. Its other original intention was to have the crocodiles live at the bottom of the pool. The Rady Falls is 65 feet high, making it around seven stories and is dubbed by the zoo as the largest waterfall in the city. Madagascar, Africa's most famous island. It begins a single serpent winding pathway without any interruptions and starts this unusual looking span of meshed exhibits that stretch all the way into the next section appearing as if they're all connected and even holding each other up. All of the enclosures from here to that point have ground levels that are nearly elevated to your eyeline. The first animal isn't even native to the eighth continent at all. The fearless honey badger. At only around three feet, they're still known to be the bravest and fiercest creature on earth. You may have heard that they were taken off display at the zoo. Well, rumor has it that they kept escaping and obviously the exhibit needed some fixing. Honey badgers are native to all of Africa but the northern regions and even Southwest Asia. So why place them in Madagascar? Well, according to the original plans, they were supposed to be further down in a more appropriate area. Obviously, if you couldn't tell, I didn't film them because even though I'm not complaining, the mesh and the angle of the design make it difficult to see the animals. Next up are two enclosures for the island's most iconic inhabitants, the lemurs. There's ringtails, red collar, red ruff, the rare blue-eyed black lemur, and the cockerel sheep faka, an animal that can cover 40 feet from just one leap from the air. Unfortunately, like the badger and the next stop, the animals didn't show themselves enough for me to film. Nearly identical to the honey badger stage, Africa Rocks uses Fusas, the island's most prominent carnivore, to close out the third leg of this tour. The acacia woodlands refers to the acacia tree, one of the most commonly recognized flora on the African plains. The exhibit tree is very similar to Madagascar and two has four enclosures. The first one, the vervet monkey, one of the few woodland slash shrubland primates and considered to be one of the most intelligent but mischievous creatures on the savannah. On the left side of the winding path is a gorgeous nearly quarter acre walk through aviary. Unfortunately, and of course on the weekend that I visit, all of aviaries throughout the park were closed from public access. 
However, if you'd like to see it, I suggest going to the link in the description to watch an amazing POV perspective of the Africa Rocks. Past the monkeys once more is what's intentionally meant to be a prey living next to its predator. The Acacia Woodlands Headliner, the Leopard. However, this is not of the African variety, rather the Amur Leopard of Russia. But because African leopards are so rare in the US, it's not uncommon for zoos to display Amors in their savanna collections. After all, it shouldn't matter as they are one of the most critically endangered animals around, having only a wild population of nearly 100 individuals. In Africa rocks, the one that garners the attention the most is Mystique, a regal black leopard. Like many mammals, they can experience melanism as a result of a genetic mutation. Those with this change were once thought to be a separate species. By some, it's actually considered to be an advantage in natural selection as the leopard can blend in well with the dense forest. Other than mystique, perhaps the other special thing about this habitat is the chute transfer placed up front and in the middle that's built into the rock that connects the two exhibits. This residency's largest venue, considered to be the roofs of Africa, the Ethiopian highlands formed from heavy volcanic activity, creating towering peaks of grassy plateaus, rich valleys, and unsurprisingly, deserts. Only around 20 mammals call these hills their home, and that includes the Gelata, a close cousin to the baboon, but they are in fact the only surviving member of their genus which translates from the Greek root words beasting. They're restricted to live on these windy hills and survive on grass blades and stems. Their silky mane, red hourglass patch on their chest gives a defining stage presence. When it comes to males, the one with the most colorful chest usually gets the girl. Still, this mountain monkey lives in a matriarchal society. Family units join to form bands that range in numbers up to 350 animals. As for zoos, consider yourself lucky if you ever come across one of these, because in the United States, the only other zoo to display them is at the Bronx. As you probably saw, they're not alone. The band's horn section, the Nubian Ibex. The only Ibex adapted to life in hot, arid regions, dealing with harsh sunlight from Northeast Africa and Saudi Arabia. They too live on steep, mountainous terrain, but are perfectly capable of making their way up and down the cliffs with ease. They prefer this hostile environment as a way to avoid predators, but if defense is needed, males grow these impressive horns that get up to four feet long. And much like the colors of the gelata, their horns are used to impress females. While they and the gelata have somewhat similar environments, and though some do live in the same country, I don't believe the two cross paths in the wild very often, but they do seem to get along just fine. Before we head to the next exhibit, if you're ever here, I highly suggest that you stop at this point and look at this view. Continuing the mountainous theme are two more impressive fields supported by cliffs that can combine to be over half an acre. Rocking the hair and the attitudes are the Hamadryas baboons. Much like their cousins to the right, rather than trees, they prefer to live near or on high cliffs. Hamadryases also live in complex societies. Within the same group, multiple males will establish their own units and females will decide which one to join. One troop can consist of 5 to 250 members. At the San Diego Zoo, Africa Rocks opened with 20, but my sources say that they're now up to 25 baboons, led by a king appropriately named Elvis. Now, the finale, the encore, the copy. 
As mentioned before, there are six venues in Africa Rocks, but only five are new. As part of the 1982 Heart of the Zoo Master Plan, exhibits were being transformed in a dramatic fashion towards a more natural approach. Orangutans were first on the plan, but in 1986, one million dollars went into something small and into something new in an unused part of the park. 64 mock boulders and 15 tons of natural rock were used to form this ecosystem. First up is an aviary for the Batlore Eagle. A colorful bird of prey, black body and head, chestnut shoulders, and a very intimidating bear red face. In flight, they are more recognizable by their unusually short tail, and is often seen tilting their wings side to side as if they're on a tightrope trying to balance, which is where they get their name, which means acrobat and juggler. Up next are the faces of the copy rocks. A few escape artists when they're usually left in an open-topped enclosure such as this. The first, the little guys, the dwarf mongoose. Not only the smallest of the mongoose family, but they are the continent's smallest predator. They seek outcroppings that are closer to the ground. The second band member is just a little higher up. The rock hyrax. Although it resembles a rabbit size and shape, Genetic evidence suggests that they are closely related to hoofed animals. Its plump appearance may not make it a rocker, but it is a master climber, as they have padded, sweaty feet that act as suction cups to get a good grip. And the last member of this group, the Clip Springer, perhaps the most famous animal on these rocks. Their name is an Afrikaans word meaning rock jumper. They are only 25 pounds and stand at 2 feet at the shoulder. And as seen here, they live among the boulders and browse through the shrubs and herbs. But when threatened, they can jump from rock to rock in a seemingly impossible fashion. The trail then takes you further into the rock to a small aviary which you can see a full species list below. In the corner by the bend, what once contained a leopard is now a serval, a small cat that can jump up to 10 feet high just to snag its prey. And now, as we head towards the exit facing the bus tour road, is another aviary for trumpeter hornbills. And if we continue down that road, we'll observe the last of the set list. One of the largest and most complex dig sites for the meerkat, considered the headliner of the copy. And then finally, Africa Rocks concludes with a modest cage for yellow spotted hyraxes showing off their climbing skills on branches rather than boulders. When most people think of African creatures, their minds will usually picture giraffes, elephants, or lions. The San Diego Zoo's Africa Rocks gives you more to marvel at this continent's rich diversity and its variety of life forms from regal to the small and almost forgotten. I think it's safe to say, in my opinion, that this is the single greatest project in the San Diego Zoo's history. But I want you to comment below what you think of this new development. But whatever that may be, I hope this residency left you, as the zoo says, starstruck. Thank you for watching.